Brian Barnett is just a regular guy. He's not a doctor. He has no legal license in any field of mental health nor emotional health. Brian Barnett merely shares the insights he has gained from his personal experiences for anybody who may choose to use such information as they individually and personally choose while accepting full responsibility for their own individual thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Brian Barnett assumes no responsibility whatsoever for anybody's individual choice to expose himself or herself to any information that Brian Barnett shares. And by listening to this program, you are acknowledging that you and only you are responsible for your own thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Happy Thursday, everybody. Welcome back to The Last Symptom. I am Brian Barnett, the creator and host. I want to mention my website to you, thelastsymptom.com. While you're there, if you'd like to make a donation to support my overall body of work, which includes that website itself, as well as this podcast and all of my other efforts, I thank you. Uh, I got some correspondence here, and I want to share it with you because it involves an expression that keeps coming up, meet the criteria. You ever get the feeling that... uh, Members of the professional community, they're just a bunch of tin robots walking around uttering pre-programmed expressions. Well, meet the criteria is one of those expressions that makes me want to beat my head against the wall because it reveals such a lack of understanding of borderline personality disorder and, you know, emotional unhealth in general. But it's something that just gets used over and over and over again by by the professional community. Meet the criteria. If I had a nickel for every time somebody said to me, my therapist says I no longer meet the criteria, blah, blah, blah. And yet that person still obviously has borderline personality disorder. I would be a rich man. I would take those nickels to the bank and I'd be a rich man. What is the criteria that the professional community uses for their observations? Well, their criteria are your thoughts, your words, your behaviors. Now, let me ask you this. Are your thoughts, your words, your behaviors, are they what make borderline personality disorder? Are they, are they the, the things that, that are borderline personality disorder? No, no. They're just the symptoms of borderline personality disorder. They're just the symptoms. What is borderline personality disorder? It's your underlying perspectives that you live with. So the underlying perspectives is the cause. That is is what borderline personality disorder is. It's your underlying perspectives. And your thoughts, behaviors, your words, those things are symptoms of the cause. They're the, they're the naturally resulting things that happen because of the cause. So what is more important, the symptoms or the cause? What should your focus be, the symptoms or the cause? Obviously, it's the cause. And just because the symptoms may change or may not be as loud or visible or as obnoxious, that don't necessarily mean that the cause has been fixed. It is not the time to say, oh, well, I'm all better, and to stop thinking and doing that inner work. The person who wrote to me says this, according to my therapist, I no longer fit the criteria for borderline personality disorder. However, I still have many of the same thought processes that I identify with borderline personality disorder. How is this possible? Your therapist uses words like fit the criteria, And so you think he or she must know what she's talking about. But they simply do not understand borderline personality disorder. That expression reveals a total lack of understanding of the very nature of what borderline personality disorder is. The disorder doesn't go away by itself. The disorder also does not mutate into something else. If you don't feel emotionally healthy... And the only thing that's changed is their criteria, (laughs) their criteria, their definition of the criteria, which is your thoughts or words, you know, 
and the thoughts that they have access to are only the thoughts that you choose to share with them and your behaviors. These aren't your co- these aren't the cause of your problem. These are just symptoms of your problem. So if you don't feel emotionally healthy, then you're still dealing with the same causes you were dealing with. And if that's true, then you still have what you had. Remember, the professional community's focus overwhelmingly is to soothe symptoms for all time, not to cure you. Their focus is to soothe you for all time so that you walk out of their office feeling better, but they're not trying to cure you. Being cured is a vastly superior focus for you to have. You know, you either have it or you don't. And as long as you still have it, you've still got work to do. That's my only point. Fit the criteria is is worthless. It's a worthless expression. And you know, when a therapist tells you that, that the therapist is working against you. The therapist is working against your progress. Because when you hear, oh, well, I no longer fit the criteria, what do you do? What is the natural result of hearing, hey, you no longer fit the criteria for this? You relax. You stop. You say, oh, I'm at the end. But the criteria for borderline personality disorder is not borderline personality disorder. Got a siren going on here in the background. I'm just going to wait a moment and let that die down. Sounds like they're just doing circles around my house. (laughs) Because they know I'm trying to record in here. There must be a bad accident right up the road here. Wondering if that uh, that's coming across on the recording. All right, well, some we've got some peace now again. There are two primary factors that contribute to infidelity in a person with borderline personality disorder. To get started in this conversation, we have to define again the distorted core beliefs or the fundamental perspectives that people with borderline personality disorder live with. You know, the singularity from where all the effects of the disorder sprout. And the primary one is this, the belief that my feelings are inherently irrelevant and shameful, devoid of worth. Now, folks with the disorder adopted this belief or this, you know, subconscious certainty. Sometimes I call it an emotional algorithm during a relatively small window of time in their critical formative years, sometime between birth and four or five years of age. They arrived at this subconscious perspective by drawing obvious conclusions from the subtle and sometimes not so subtle, unhealthy attitudes and behaviors that their emotional teachers themselves consistently showed toward their feelings. In all cases, our emotional teachers are our parents or immediate caregivers. There's a second erroneous belief or foundation perspective that sprouts directly from the first one, and it's, if my feelings are inherently irrelevant and shameful, devoid of worth, then I myself must also be inherently irrelevant and shameful, devoid of worth. After all, your feelings are you. Now, people with borderline personality disorder are not naturally, consciously aware that they live with these fundamental perspectives, but To show you how this relates to infidelity, I'll be using a man as the protagonist through most of this discussion because I myself was the man. And I'm simply describing real life past scenarios. But if you're a woman, the causes and the effects are no different for you. Because of the two powerful, erroneous perspectives that folks with borderline personality disorder live with, which I just defined, they have no sense of inherent worth. Now, if in your experience, people with the disorder seem self-assured, it's because they're acting, and they've gotten very good at acting. Nevertheless, they truly cannot generate their own authentic sense of inner affirmation or worth for themselves. This leaves them with only external sources as a way to feel good about themselves. So if emotionally healthy people are mammals, then people with emotional disorders are cold-blooded reptiles, like snakes, 
and not like you think. Snakes are incapable of generating their own body heat, and yet they still need to get around and live. So what do they do? They go lie out in the sun. Their bodies heat up, and after a while, they're good to go. So they're good to go until the external heat wears off. And then what do they have to do? They have to go back to the sunbeam. So those with borderline personality disorder, they'll get a compliment on their looks from the secretary at work. And this is like 10 minutes in the sun. After an hour, what happens? It wears off, and they're back to feeling shameful. On a good day, a handful of girls flirt with the guy who has borderline personality disorder. Maybe he scores a phone number. And this might be like a whole day in the sun. Maybe the effects last for two or three days, but none of it matters. His true underlying belief has not gone anywhere. Beneath it all, he still believes that he's devoid of worth. So when the warmth of external affirmation or validation begins to fade, what's still there waiting? You're right, the feelings of worthlessness. There does not exist enough external affirmation in all the universe to undo, reverse, or replace what one simply believes is his inherent state. You know, I, I emphasize that word inherent a lot because that nuance is so important. No external source of validation is real or lasting. Our foundation perspectives, our foundation perspectives involve concrete conclusions about reality and no superficial external factors have any effect on them. So it don't matter how much you as the wife or girlfriend care for this guy we're describing. Contrary to romance novels and movies, love, and I put that in air quotes because I'm not convinced that what we're talking about is love, is not enough. It cannot undo, reverse, or replace the distorted, unhealthy perspective that your husband or your boyfriend lives with. His fundamental perspective about his worthlessness involves inherent realities from his subconscious point of view. It's not a reflection of any sort of insufficiency or failure on the part of the wife or the girlfriend until that husband does the work required to identify and correct his inner erroneous perceptions. He will continue to be reliant on external sources for fleeting, superficial, inferior validation. Interestingly, these effects don't always lead to infidelity. For some, the effects manifest instead as an intense fear of abandonment. That is, because an individual subconsciously believes himself or herself to be completely devoid of inherent worth and is unable to generate validation from within for, for himself or herself, well, then he or she subconsciously fears as a natural result that he or she is at a constant risk of being dumped. You see, a, a person who lives with the subconscious belief or certainty that they are just inherently valuable, that they have inherent worth, they have nothing to fear. They don't fear being abandoned or left or dumped. But think about a person who lives with the subconscious belief that they are worthless. They have a lot of reasons to fear being dumped or left or abandoned, you know. There's an, in reality, there's no such thing as adults being abandoned. So if you'd like to know more about that, listen to episode 35 of this podcast to understand why. Now, in cases where infidelity happens, you can easily see the reasons behind it. A full-on affair especially if it's with somebody we're exceptionally physically attracted to, can be like a whole week in the sun, you know, at least in the beginning. Starting off, the effects last much longer than just a mere compliment or some sexually charged text messages. In some cases, it becomes like a person who's tried one little sip of alcohol, 
which slowly intensifies with time into a case of full-blown alcoholism. For a long time, I myself, as a married man, I craved the attention, the flirting, the walking right up to the line and stopping short. But the disorder needs more and more all the time just to provide and maintain the same sense of validation. It really does become like a drug. So it was inevitable. Eventually I had one affair, then I had two, and then somewhere along the way I couldn't get enough. Once I reached this evolution of the disorder, my need for external validation had snowballed to the point where if I only slept with three women a week instead of four, I again felt worthless. And that's no exaggeration. The need evolves. A tolerance develops. So what's another natural effect of this scenario playing out? Well, additional shame. You see, the two distorted core beliefs of borderline personality disorder are simply shame elaborately described. Shame and the two distorted core beliefs or erroneous foundation perspectives that I described at the outset of this program are one and the same. And there's a reason I don't simply say that shame is the root cause of borderline personality disorder. I instead define for people the message or beliefs that the shame communicates. And this is because in order to truly do the inner work of identifying and undoing these causes, one must intuitively understand the nature of it in full detail. What happens generally after a man or a woman crosses the line into infidelity in their desperation for a break from worthlessness? While in the moment they might feel the warmth of validation, what are the effects of these actions afterwards? Well, we've already explained how there's no external validation in the entire universe which can undo, reverse, or replace the subconscious perspectives which are generating these behaviors to begin with. So, after infidelity, once the warmth has worn off and the person begins to think about the reality of his or her betrayal, do you reckon this contributes to their sense of validation? Or does it instead add to their overwhelming sense of shame? Well, it's clear, isn't it? The subconscious nagging thoughts are of this nature. This behavior proves what I have already always known, that I am shameful and devoid of worth. This is why I was able to do this thing that I have done. So in regards to the bigger picture, far from helping, infidelity generally only creates a wheel of shame. Around and around it goes. The shame created the impulses in the first place, and the result of following through on the impulses creates more shame, which in turn creates more unhealthy impulses of the same nature. So it's critical that people with borderline personality disorder become mammals by identifying and correcting the distorted core beliefs I spelled out here so that then they can finally generate their own sense of worth and affirmation within themselves. This is the cure to the entire disorder. Now, I would like to mention that infidelity in itself is not evidence, is not evidence that one has an emotional disorder. I've mentioned this in past episodes. Emotionally healthy people choose to have affairs all the time, and my explaining this has nothing to do with moral considerations whatsoever. Rather, I'm simply stating the reality in terms of emotional health and emotional unhealth. When discussing matters of emotional health, it's rare, so rare as to practically be never, the behavior itself that can be classified as healthy or as unhealthy. Instead, it's the motivating forces behind the behavior which determine if it's emotionally healthy or emotionally unhealthy. For example, you take two women who exercise at the gym for 10 hours a day. The first woman does it because she's convinced that her very worth as a person depends on looking like a movie star. 
you see the forces motivating her to spend 10 hours at the gym are unquestionably unhealthy. Therefore, her behaviors are evidence of emotional unhealth. The second woman spends the exact same amount of time at the gym doing the exact same workout routine. But what motivates her is not that she believes her worth as a human being depends on her figure. Rather, she values her health. She sees her body as something with inherent value, worth taking care of as best she can. Therefore, this woman's behaviors are evidence of good emotional health. You see, two people doing exactly the same thing, but the motivating force behind it is different for each one. And that is what determines emotional health or emotional unhealth. So behaviors, even infidelity, is not what determines good emotional health or poor emotional health. Rather, it's the motivating force behind these behaviors. Now, we've covered pretty good how one of the effects of not being able to generate your sense of validation for yourself inside yourself can be a a strong factor for infidelity. There's another thing that we need to discuss. And it's important for me to say that not every person who has borderline personality disorder cheats on his or her partner. Nevertheless, whether a person with borderline personality disorder ever cheats or not is sort of irrelevant to this discussion, even though it's the the whole topic of the conversation. Because the reality is that every single person who lives with the disorder is secretly living with the exact same issues that lead those who do cheat to cheat. So to say it another way, just because a person with borderline personality disorder may never cheat, he or she is still living with precisely the same fundamental issues that translate into infidelity for some. And those issues are creating great unhappiness for everybody with the disorder, infidelity or not. Now, if you'll remember, when we started this discussion, we explained the two false foundation perspectives that folks with borderline personality disorder live with. The two causes at the root of the entirety of borderline personality disorder itself. And one of them is my feelings are inherently irrelevant and shameful devoid of worth. Aside from naturally making it impossible for people to generate their own inner sense of self-worth, what's another result of this distorted perspective? Well, very simply, it also causes people with the disorder to completely reject any and all chances at genuine intimacy, no matter what situation they might be in. Married, dating, it don't matter. Why do they do this? They do it because of the intense feelings of embarrassment and shame that they secretly live with toward their feelings, and especially toward any feelings which might in any way reveal vulnerability. What is intimacy? It's the revealing and sharing of your genuine self, which involves the sharing of your deepest authentic feelings with another trusted person. The very nature of intimacy involves being emotionally vulnerable, honest, and open with another person. Now, ask yourself this. Is intimacy an optional life ingredient in order for humans to enjoy true emotional health and contentment? Is it one of those things that are nice to experience, but that we can do just fine without? No, it's not. Intimacy is not optional when we discuss matters of true emotional health. Rather, intimacy is a human need. It's a non-negotiable ingredient in order for one to enjoy a healthy, happy, balanced, fulfilling life. Now, it's true that some people stay single for their entire lives. There's nothing wrong with that. Some people become hermits. But without intimate friendships or intimate relationships of some sort, the natural consequences of this sort of lifestyle do not result in emotional balance and health. Quite the contrary. You've seen these guys (laughs) 
these hermits have been living by themselves for 30 years. They never interact with anybody else. Do those people seem healthy and well-balanced to you? <laughs> they don't even comb their hair. As I've explained in the past, anytime we are deficient in a need, we suffer negative consequences from that deficiency. But more than this, it forces our subconscious mind to search for ways to relieve that deficiency with or without us. In the article, Intimacy, Oranges, and Fish Eyeballs, I told the story of a British couple lost at sea who began consuming the eyeballs of fish they'd catch. Now, this was really strange because neither one of them had any understanding whatsoever where this craving was coming from. Fish eyeballs were certainly not anything they had ever craved before. It wasn't until after their rescue they discovered that fish eyeballs are naturally high in vitamin C, which of course they had become deficient in. As you know, vitamin C is also not an optional ingredient for good health in humans. Are you as astonished as I am at the power of their subconscious minds to figure out without them that fish eyeballs contain vitamin C? That's just unbelievable to me. To then create a craving toward a thing that they would never naturally be drawn to and effectively control their behaviors, thus working in their interests to relieve the deficiency and provide for their needs. But just as fish eyeballs are not the ideal method for getting our vitamin C needs met, folks with borderline personality disorder who, as an unavoidable result of the very nature of the disorder, are deficient in intimacy, seek inferior substitutes to relieve their desperate subconscious cravings. As you probably guessed by now, sex, masturbation, affairs, passionate trysts, these things are powerful, related substitutes for genuine intimacy. Unfortunately, they are inferior related substitutes. They may produce some emotional similarities to what sometimes accompanies certain aspects of genuine intimacy, but they do not, alone by themselves, fulfill the emotional need that only authentic intimacy is able to provide. So now we see two different effects tied directly to the root cause of borderline personality disorder and how they complement each other to the ongoing detriment of its victims. One, the individual is unable to generate any sense of worth from within. As a result, his or her only way to feel good about himself or herself is by means of external sources. You see, experience and attraction Experience and attraction directed at us from other people is a perfect example of external validation. It makes us feel good about ourselves. Even when we can't generate those good feelings about ourselves for ourselves, somebody becomes attracted to us, that's the substitute. Simultaneously, the same person who is already unable to generate his or her own inner self-worth has also been living with an intense intimacy deficiency since he or she was four or five years old. So now imagine the power of the desperate subconscious craving that they're walking around with to relieve this need. Their fear of intimacy is proportionately rivaled only by their craving for it. So this is a real-life example of an unstoppable force coming up against an immovable object. Folks with borderline personality disorder, as long as they live with the causes of the disorder, will simply not take advantage of the healthy opportunities for intimacy that they already have available to them. The only alternative their subconscious mind has, then, is to search out related but superficial inferior substitutes. Heightened sexual desires, 
extreme compulsions related to masturbation, frequent widespread compulsive flirting, sexual trysts, the need for regular ongoing attention and attraction from multiple sources, and yes, infidelity are all examples of some of the related but inferior substitutes that people who are intimacy deficient resort to for relief. So the solution, as I mentioned before, is exactly the same solution for both symptoms that we've analyzed here today. One must unravel and correct the distorted false perceptions that they live with regarding their inherent nature and the inherent nature of their feelings so that they can become able to generate their own sense of self-worth from within, totally independent of any external factors. And a natural related part of being able to do this will be the ability to enjoy genuine intimacy. In all respects, correcting the two distorted core beliefs that form the foundation of borderline personality disorder is the primary task that must be addressed in order for people living with the disorder to be able to truly escape it and enjoy genuine emotional health. There's our discussion about infidelity. To finish today, I've got a poem by Thomas Campion, 1567 to 1619. The poem is called The Man of Life Upright. The man of life upright, whose guiltless heart is free from all dishonest deeds or thought of vanity, the man whose silent days in harmless joys are spent, for whom hopes cannot delude, nor sorrow discontent. That man needs neither towers, nor armor for defense, nor secret vaults to fly from thunder's violence. He's able to behold with unfrightened eyes the horrors of the deep and terrors of the skies, thus scorning all the cares that fate or fortune brings. He makes heaven his book, his wisdom heavenly things, good thoughts his only friends, his wealth a well-spent age, the earth his sober in, and quiet pilgrimage. Thomas Campion, 1567 to 1619, the man of life upright. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you have the greatest week in the entire universe. I want to remind you to run over to thelastsymptom.com, and if you're so inclined, leave me a donation to support my overall body of work, which includes this podcast and the website there itself. This is Brian Barnett signing off. As always, thanks for listening.